John, and a particular welcome to Sarah's parents and for any else who don't know us who've come along today. Do hope that we'll share God's great hope with each other and seek to show this in the ways that we live, in truth and love. We'll be seeing more of that later when Matthew comes to speak to us. Now, a couple of notices for next week. We've got the great privilege of meeting in God's name to pray on Wednesday. And that'll be in Jackie and Steve's house at 7.30. So the midweek study groups won't be happening. Now, amongst other things, as we meet, we'll be remembering our brothers and sisters at Christ Church, Newcastle, who are part of the North East Gospel Partnership, and you might remember, helped us out an awful lot at St. Oswald's. Now, last week, we remembered Gafcon, and were so privileged to be part of not just Gafcon, but the whole worldwide family of those who share the same rescue and have the same hope in Jesus. And it's in his name that we meet today. Let's acknowledge that in the words of our opening prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we know that you are here with us. Help us to confess our sins, to sing your praises, to join in prayer, and to hear your word to us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let's stand and sing of Jesus, the same Jesus who sits in heaven as shepherd and king, having paid the ransom that we need for our rescue. Let's stand to sing, there is a higher throne. Mm -hmm. Jesus sits on the throne right now and 
The same one who sits there has made us faultless through his sacrifice. Now Jesus knows everything about us, including all those things that were so relieved are private. The things that don't give God the glory. And we need to bring those things to mind now, painful though they are, and to turn away from them. Not because that doing this will save us, but because he has saved us. Let's join in the words of the confession and then remind ourselves of our rescue as we share in the words of the creed, the things that we believe. Let's join in the words of the confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you, glory of God, in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and help us to serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Now, as John says, in his first letter, chapter 1, verse, beginning at verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Lord God, we thank you for the peace you have won for all those who trust in your work for them, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Amen. Amen. Now this is great news of forgiveness for all of us, so let's stand in the light of this and join in the words of the creed, the things that we believe. I believe in your heart, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And as we've just sung, we are made faultless through the Lamb, believing hearts find promised grace, salvation comes. Now, Julie's going to teach us about another amazing person in the family of people made right with God through belief in Jesus. Julie, please join us. Can I start? I just want to ask Edward a question. Edward, what does a limpet do? Thinks of the rock. It'll be full of pouncing. <laughs> Keep listening. Last week I found in my purse a special two pound coin. In the middle it has the year 1807 and a chain. And it was made in 2007. So it commemorates something that happened 200 years ago. Does anyone know what that is? Ah, if you can read round the edge of the coin, you'll see that it says Act of the Abolition of the Slave Trade. And on the 25th of March in 1807, an act of parliament made it illegal for people to be sold as slaves. Now the person I'm gonna talk about today is John Newton. And John Newton was a slave trader. But after an amazing conversion experience, his life changed and he fought very hard to end the slave trade that he'd been involved in. 
and he lived just long enough to see the law pass as he died in December 1807. Amen. But we're going to go back to the beginning. John Newton was born in 1725. His father was a sea captain, so he was away at sea a lot, but his mother looked after him at home. And she was a Christian and she taught him very well from the Bible and told him stories about Jesus. But just before John's seventh birthday, something very sad died, happened. His mother died of a very common illness then called consumption, which we know as tuberculosis. So John was sent to boarding school until he was 11, and then he became a sailor on his father's ship. When he was 18, John was forced to join the Navy, which he didn't want to do, and he wasn't very happy. And John was a wild and angry young man. He behaved very badly, he broke all the rules, he bullied and he terrified his crewmates. He swore and blasphemed and did wicked things. He even talked talk to Christian into unbelief, taught him to not believe in Jesus. John Newton squandered all the good teaching that his mother, he had received from his mother. He turned against God and violently and viciously opposed all things Christian. He was so bad and uncontrollable that he was sent to work on the slave ships that carried people from Africa to America. The people on the ships were taken from their homes and they were sold for money so they belonged to other people. Life on board the slave ships was terrible and the slaves were treated very badly. Benjamin's been learning about the slave trade at school and he said it's so graphic the way they were treated. He said it's just too graphic to talk about here. Now when John was 23, he became very ill. He became so ill that even the slaves on the ships felt sorry for him. So he sent word to his father to ask him to send a ship to bring him back to England. So his father sent a ship called the Greyhound. And on the way back to England, on the 10th of March, 1748, the ship sailed into a huge and violent storm with gale force winds and waves that crashed over the ship and everything that wasn't tied down was washed overboard, including one of the sailors. And as John tried to steer the ship through the storm, he heard the most terrifying noise and he knew exactly what it was. It was the sound of splintering wood and he knew that the ship was going to sink. He knew that the ship was breaking up and he knew that he was going to die. And then he remembered some words that his mother used to say. Lord, forgive me and have mercy on me. So John Newton shouted into the wind and the waves, Lord, have mercy on me and forgive me. And miraculously, the ship didn't sink, John didn't die, and he made it back to London. And John Newton knew that God had saved him. His life was completely transformed. Edward, what does a limpet do? It sticks to the rock. Well, John Newton stuck to the gospel of Jesus like a limpet sticks to a rock. No more swearing and blaspheming. He started to pray and read the Bible. He went to church, he changed job and became an evangelical Anglican minister. He started a Sunday school, he wrote hymns, and he wrote them to help people remember the teaching that they'd received. And his most famous hymn, which he wrote for a New Year's Day hymn, was Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. John knew that God's grace, that's God's undeserved mercy and kindness in forgiving him, wasn't through any goodness of his own, it was through Jesus Christ who had saved him. John began preaching against the slave trade. He knew what a terrible thing it was, and he taught people how wrong and cruel it was to sell people for money. And he wrote a book called An Authentic Narrative, and John was able to give eyewitness accounts of the appalling treatment on the board these, and the brutal treatment of the slaves. And this provided powerful ev evidence against the slave trade. 
and he joined a politician, a young man called William Wilberforce, who led the campaign to end Britain's part in slave trading. When John Newton was old, blind and near death, he said to a friend who came to see him, he said, my memory is fading, but I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great saviour. John Newton's life teaches us that God can change the most unexpected people, and even the worst of sinners can be saved by God's amazing grace. If John can be, if John Newton could be Jesus' friends, then anybody could be. Now, a few years ago, I came across a prayer by John Newton, and Benjamin wrote it out for me, and he stuck it on my fridge. And this is the prayer which I wrote to end with. John Newton wrote, Lord, I know I am not who I one day will be, but I thank you that I am not who I used to be. Please make me more like Christ today than I was yesterday, and please answer that prayer each day until the day I stand before you. Amen. Julie, thank you very much indeed for that powerful explanation of the work of the gospel in one life and in a society, lots of lives. Now, Julie is going to come and lead us in our prayers before Helen shares the first of our readings from the Bible. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father God, that all around the world you continue to make yourself known, to grow disciples, and to bring good news to those yearning for hope. Jesus commissioned his disciples to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it's been brilliant to be reminded in the book of Acts of the work of the Holy Spirit in growing the early church and of its spread. Thank you for that apostolic witness recorded for us and unchanged in its message of love, grace, and mercy. In this century, there's evidence of dramatic growth of the Christian population in parts of Africa and Asia, and of God's Spirit reaching beyond all borders and calling all nations to himself. And in countries where governments try to enforce their beliefs, people have realized that this world and other gods, whether spiritual or political ones, can't be trusted and can't satisfy. And when confronted with a God who doesn't change, who is all good and all sovereign, people are finding the good news they've longed for. Thank you for countries like Zambia, where the church is the vehicle bringing life and hope and love to many, where the government can't. In the 2,000 years of the ongoing spread of the gospel, we thank God for his plan and purposes, which cannot be thwarted, and which are utterly trustworthy and unstoppable. Amen. Amen. Closer to home, help us, Lord God, not lose sight of your will and purpose in making the good news of Jesus known here. Let's pray this morning for gospel work in Wall's End and for the thousands of people living here who've never given serious thought to Jesus. Thank you for the good connections Ben is building with local churches and with their leaders. In his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul addresses a problem some of them were having of divided loyalties to the church leaders, Apollos and Paul. He reminds them that it is God alone who is responsible for church growth and for the spread of the gospel. Paul writes, What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labour. For we're co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. So let's pray for ourselves and for gospel-hearted churches, fellowships and individuals throughout Wall's End acknowledging that it is God who plants waters and makes the gospel grow. We pray that churches in this area would work towards one purpose, united by the word of God and the person of Christ, outward looking and not self-interested. Please build us up and mature us here at Hope Church, standing on the firm foundation of Jesus. And we do pray that there would be much gospel fruit and vibrant growth in this area. 
that those lost without you and facing your judgment would know the joy and security of the sure hope of heaven and that your name would be known and glorified more widely. We pray for the short-term future of our church family, asking please that you would provide us with a more permanent home from the end of September so that we can develop opportunities to welcome people through the week too. Thank you for these first few months of Hope Church, for helping us through this time of changing pains that Ben was talking about last <coughs> week. Whatever God's purpose is for a base for us and for our future together, let's pray that as co-workers in his service, we will have a genuine heart for our friends and neighbours and that we will be worthy of being God's field and his building. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for the children now having their own Bible time next door. Father God, please give wisdom to Julie, Jackie and Valentina as they teach them stories and truths from the Bible each week. Please inspire each of the children to love learning about Jesus and one day to make a lifelong commitment to him. We give you great thanks for any of our children who are now adults, who are still going on as Christians and who are active, serving members of their church families elsewhere. We don't take for granted the miracle it is that you have given them a living faith and that you're sustaining them in it and for that we thank you very much. Some of our children though have turned their backs on you after many years of hearing the gospel being taught and explained. So we pray earnestly for them and ask please that your Holy Spirit would prompt them to know their need for you so that they would turn back to you and live for your glory, not their own. Before we pray the Lord's Prayer together, let's quietly commit to God and pray for people and situations we're concerned about, knowing that God always answers prayers in the way he knows to be best. So let's pray quietly in our hearts now, bringing these people and situations to the Lord. Thank you, Father God, that you hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. Let's finish this time of prayer by saying the Lord's Prayer together as we acknowledge our dependence on our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. from um, 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're, gone, uh, whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognise the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is, is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognise the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Thank you, Helen, very much. Now, before Matthew comes to bring God's word to us, we're going to remember Jesus' precious name as we join in a song written by John Newton. Not that one, but John Newton and Julie told us about together, and he explained how the immense worth that Jesus had to him. Let's stand to sing how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in the believer's ear. <laughs> This morning I have three simple words that I want you to remember um, from the talk. If you don't nothing else, I'd love you to remember some more than three words. But if it's only three words you can hold in your brain, then um, they're three words. And uh, the first is something that um, Steve was doing yesterday, um, that Len likes to do. Um, any guesses on, on what the first word might be? We can move on to the third if you're not sure. Well, yes, well done. The third... The third, uh, Lindsay likes to do this, June uh, enjoys doing this. What, what do you think the third might be? Oh, you're running. Yeah, so, so walk is the first word. The third word is, um, is run. What do you think the, uh, the catchphrase might be that I'm stealing blatantly from someone sitting at the back? Anyone remember as well the day club? We have a go, Steve? Yes. Oh, I thought I was going to shoot you. I couldn't record. Oh, God. So, 
Walk, don't run. Uh, Steve's catchphrase from Holiday Club. That's uh, the three words I like to remember today. It's, it's a great catchphrase for, for Holiday Club, for, uh, for keeping children safe, um, although sometimes at too high a volume. But it's okay. also a great catchphrase for us in the Christian life. Walk, don't run. That's the three words I like to remember. Um, that'll be one of the themes of my talk this morning. Uh, but I'll first I'll pray before we dive into the second letter of John. Lord God, we thank you that all your word is written for us. Please give us wisdom as we consider this short letter to see how your words through John apply to our church today. Help us to walk in truth and love with you day by day. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you know, um, country Rwanda uh, seems to have been in the news quite a lot recently uh, for a small Central African country. Um, it's been in the news, obviously, for our um, government's cunning and expensive wheeze, uh, which so far has managed to ship no asylum seekers off to Rwanda, uh, but spent a lot of money um, to, in the effort that it might deter some coming by boat, is the hope. And then they had the, com the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting as well last week, so leaders from all over the world descended on Rwanda, um, Prince Charles, Boris Johnson, among others. Uh, it's also, though, Rwanda has been in the Anglican news uh, recently, which doesn't make it up on the news as 10 um, as often. Um, there's been two arguments, and this is this unusual for Anglicans. They tend to argue behind closed doors and be terribly polite with each other. But there's been two public arguments between um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of Rwanda, um, Laurent Mbanda. I hope I've pronounced that right, but I don't know. Um, They've had one argument recently about the refugee policy because um, Laura Lavanda felt that the public letters and the um, public stances of the Anglican Church in this country, the CAB, um, had shaded into being quite insulting about his country and that actually they're great at looking after refugees and he wants to defend them and say, we are um, actually we're a stable um, country, we, we need people to come here and work, people who are seeking asylum we will we'll treat well. Um, so don't... Um, don't start painting us in any other way, please. But the other argument they had um, was about the Lambeth Conference, which um, is going to be a big gathering in, um, in Lambeth uh, and in Canterbury, uh, which is happening in a month's time, and Justin Welby is the host of that. And he's invited bishops from all over the world, um, there's hundreds of them coming and their spouses, um, to get together. It's supposed to be once a decade, it hasn't happened for about 15 years, this one's been a bit delayed. But Lauren Amanda is uh, one of the archbishops who's decided not to come. Uh, he's declined the invitation, um, along with uh, other countries like uh, Nigeria, um, the Archbishop of Kenya is not coming, um, the uh, Ugandan Anglicans are not coming. And they had a public argument about this. So, so Justin Welby wrote in a letter um, that he put on the internet, God calls us to unity, not to conflict, so that the world may know he came from the Father. That's the very purpose of the church globally. Boycotts do not proclaim Christ. Those who stay away cannot be heard. They will lose influence and the chance of shaping the future. All of us will be the poorer spiritually as a result of your absence. So that's his argument, is about unity, about being together, and that if you're not here, you, you can't, you can't um, influence. The archbishops of Nigeria, Rwanda and Uganda wrote a letter together publicly, again, with their view. Sadly, it's an example of virtue signaling, they say, that condones evil by hiding behind endless prayer and discussion thereby giving the impression that what's really laudable is the discussion rather than the decision to obey the clear word of God on the pressing issue of human sexuality and marriage. Genuine Christian faith does not separate between the faith and the life of the believer, they say. You can look up those letters, they're on the internet, there's several pages in both of them, and there's a bit to and fro apart from that. Who's right? Both are relying on the Bible for their message. Maybe just a world is being stronger on love and unity, and the African archbishops are stronger on truth and obedience. Is the truth actually somewhere between both approaches? Can we have love and unity and truth and obedience, or do we have to choose? As it appears, those letters seem to say you're having to choose. Well, we're going to read the short letter of 2 John um, that helps us work through some principles that help us to think that sort of issue through, and also similar issues locally um, to inform our life together as a church family, and also tells us to walk, not run. So I'm going to read that. It's, it's lovely to find a short letter, isn't it, in the Bible, where they often seem to just write and write and write. Um, John seems, 2 John, 3 John, seemed to be, I had one sheet of papyrus and I fitted on that, or whatever he was using to write, what I could fit on. It's like the old airmail, when you had to try and fit everything you wanted to say on maybe both sides of that blue, thin blue paper. Um, so 2 John, 3 John, they're exactly the same length. We're going to be looking at those this week and next week. 
Uh, but I'm going to read to John now, so I'm going to read the whole of my letter, and it's going to take me about three minutes. The elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth, which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we've worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. Stop. Yeah, I was, just, I was about to stop and say, normally I have a phone here to record, and I just realised it's not here while I was reading. So we both remember the same point. So we'll record from this point on for people who listen to the sermon on the website. So welcome people on the website. Uh, you haven't missed much, you've read, missed um, two John, and uh, you've missed an introduction, which is about Rwanda, and about um, walk, don't run, is going to be one of the themes. So that's then caught up. So we're taking a break from the book of Acts, which we've been looking at as you, if you've been here, and uh, we've seen the beginning of the church in Jerusalem, some of the challenges it faced. We're probably going to come back to that in the autumn, if you're enjoying it. But this week and next, we've got these two little letters, two John this week, three John next week near the back of our Bibles. They're, they're letters we don't read very often. We often um, flip past, or often don't flip past, because if you flip past, you end up in Revelation, and we tend to try and avoid that. So uh, we often don't get that far. But they're at the back, if you weren't aware they were there. One John you might know, because in the autumn, we, if you were with us when we were at St. Oswald's, we did look through one John. And we got to the end of one John, and we stopped. And this is two John, which is just over the page um, from there. Helen read um, some of it earlier so that we could remember some of the themes. He wrote that longer letter to encourage Christians so they could be sure that they have eternal life and could be sure of Christ. And the main marks of that assurance were truth, love and obedience, all of which were in that chapter Helen read to some, some degree. Truth, love and obedience. So that we could be sure we have eternal life. Oh, I did want to say Revelation isn't worth reading, by the way. Don't be scared. It's actually a great book. But um, it is the truth that we often avoid it. So we're coming back to the shorter letters of 2 and 3 John, we'll see some of those same principles. Truth, love, obedience worked out in church life as we look through these two letters. And what do we know about them? Well, they're, they're similar themes. They're also quite similar to 1 John in style and language, so that's why they got put together in this little group at the back. Because it's assumed that all three are written by the Apostle John, who we saw in Acts um, being sort of Peter's silent partner as he went around healing people and John was there with him. That was the last time we saw um, John. But John doesn't use his own name, just as in the Gospel, where he's the disciple that Jesus loves. He likes to put himself in the background and point to Jesus. In this letter he calls himself the Elder, which is very self-effacing for an Apostle. It's probably a couple of generations after what we read about in Acts. John's now an old man, probably. We're not really sure, because all we have is this letter. Um, and we have traditions about it, which are probably true. So he's probably an old man, literally an Elder, Probably, but also along with others, one of the elders that governed the churches in the area where he lived. Probably somewhere around Turkey. Uh, one of the elders, but able to refer to himself as the elder in this letter, uh, because of his status as an apostle. And we see in Acts how the church, we will see in the autumn, or whenever we come back to Acts, how the church spread out Jerusalem, spread around the whole of the Mediterranean, uh, whole of the Roman world. Um, and by the time this letter was written, well established. So this is a couple of generations later. And as we saw in Acts, another similarity is that normal church life is the mix of the, the good, the bad, the downright ugly. And we've seen some of all of that in the early chapters of Acts. We see more of that in this letter. So John writes this letter, he's writing from a normal church, 
um, with its mixture of encouragements and discouragements, good and bad, to a normal church that he knows. And if it's from a letter, well, I say to a normal church, but it doesn't say a normal church, does it? It says it's to a lady. I'm jumping ahead and making assumptions there. The chosen lady and her children, it sounds like a code, um, but he doesn't want to name her. And then at the end of the letter, you get the children of the chosen sister sending greetings. I'm assuming it's a church family, and that the lady is the church, the children are the members of the church. Because if, if it's a lady and it's her sister, then um, when he says, I ask we love one another, he's shading into being a bit inappropriate for an elder and apostle there. And he's saying that's the command, that we love each other. Um, sounds a little bit abusive. So, so probably not, it's probably a church, I'm guessing. Um, so that's the most likely. And then the children of the chosen sister are the members of the church that John was with, the church that he's part of. So he's writing as an apostle from one local church situation to another. And what does he write about? He writes about the good of church life. So that's first. He's met some members of this church. He's found them walking in truth, keeping on going with Jesus. It's, it's the secrets of, um, of giving good feedback. He's always start with the positive. So he starts with the positive. I've met some of your members, I've met some of your children, it gave me great joy to find them walking in the truth. Um, it's like Ben bumping into some of the people he knew from the international ministry at JPC. So Jonathan, who's with us today, being really encouraged to find that they're still keeping on following Jesus. But then when he talks to them, he also hears some concerning things that are going on there. So, uh, so maybe he sits down to write a letter, um, writes to Jonathan Bright, David Holloway, to share those encouragements, but also the concerns that he's picked up. Apart from Ben, he's an apostle, so he wouldn't write with the same authority. But that's the sort of letter we've got, that he's bumped into some people from his church, he's heard great things, he's also heard some things that are making him a bit um, unsure, so he's written this, this little letter. Did you spot the key words when I read the first few verses? I'll read the first four verses again. The way John likes to emphasise words is to use them again and again, say so these are my themes. So, to the lady chosen by God and to her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. So truth is a big thing for John in this short letter. Truth matters, and he's really pleased to find that some from this church are walking in the truth. Walking, not running. But now he wants them also to walk in love too. So spot that other key word, I'll read verses 3 to 6 again. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ the Father, the Son, will be with us in truth and love. It's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So five mentions of truth, four of love in the first six verses. So he's writing one page, it's a nice short letter, but he's managing to say truth and love. These are the things I really want to emphasise. You can't have one without the other, truth and love. Walk in truth, walk in love. Sometimes we treat truth and love as if they're opposites. And that's partly because we meet people who embody pure truth with no love, and pure love with no real concern for truth. So we might see someone who's um, really excited about truth, is really harsh and uncaring. And we think, well, yeah, you might be right, but I don't want to really spend too much time with you because you're quite hard to be around. Um, or we might find someone who's full of love, who's full of compassion, who's kind and compassionate, but finds it difficult to express hard truths, who's just sort of marshmallow in their love. And because of that, we think maybe we need to dial one or both of them down if we're going to combine them. But is there a way that we can walk in truth and walk in love with both turned up to ten? Is it possible to have them both dialed up? Is it possible to love people while speaking and believing, confronting truths? Because often in our experience, people fall off one side or the other. They're either loving or they're, they're committed to truth. But can you have both completely? Of course. Jesus was the most loving person you could imagine. But he was passionate about the truth. And he never shied away from telling people what they wanted to hear. And what they, sorry, what they needed to hear. It's a little slip of the tongue there. He always shied away from telling people what they wanted to hear. He never shied away from telling people what they needed to hear. Because truth matters. That's why you don't tell people what they want to hear if you really love them. You tell them what they need to hear. We love each other. And in the, in the church we love each other because of the truth we share. 
So that's why we say a creed together each Sunday. We stand up and we say, I believe in. That's because um, we're saying the church is, is for people who have a shared commitment to truth. And there are certain core truths that we hold in common with each other. It's not a club for those who like singing together, those who like listening to sermons. It's a gathering for those with shared beliefs, beliefs, beliefs about God, about Jesus, about ourselves. So that's why we say the creed weekly, to say this, these are the core things we've got in, in common with each other. Because other than that, we don't have a huge amount of common. And uh, fundamentally, that's what church is, a gathering of God's people. Others who don't share those beliefs, always welcome, of course. But the reason we put that in is to say, this is the reason we're meeting together. And God's people are those who know the truth through Jesus, who've been made God's children, who love each other, and hopefully we also demonstrate love to each other because God first loved us. So those should be two marks of we show as a church, truth that we share and love for each other. Love and truth go together intrinsically, because if you have truth without love, we might think they're opposites, but truth without love can't be complete. Because the truth is, as Helen read, God is love. At the heart of reality is the self-giving love of God. So that sort of heartless intellectual point scoring form of truth isn't actually truth. It's missing fundamentals because it's missing God is love. It's missing Jesus. But while love without truth becomes sentimentality, unless love is anchored in reality, in truth, it can't know what's best for others. You need truth to be able to know how best to love someone. It can't be modelled on the love God has for us because that's rooted in the truth of who God is. And it can't desire and will the true good for others because you can't know what that good is. So love without truth isn't real love, just as truth without love isn't true. What is the true good for each, other, for each of us if, um, if love is willing the true good for others and we can know that? Well, John tells us the true good for each one of us is to walk in obedience. This is love. This is God's command, verse 6. Walk in love. Just as we can't separate love from truth, so we can't separate either of them from obedience. Love, truth, obedience. We're commanded to love. The best way to love is to obey God's law. We sound counterintuitive because our society will tell us that's absolutely the worst way to love because that's restricting people. Whereas actually, John is saying the best way to love is obedience. That tells you the path to walk in to to know God's love and the way God is loved. God has told us the way to live, the way to love others. If you obey his commands, you will be closest to that, as close as you can be. So, so as we obey God's love, we'll walk in the path that God's prepared for us. That's the walk a bit. Christian life's often compared to a race, but it's an endurance race. I don't like, I find it really weird watching the fast walking. Um, just odd what they do with their legs. But it, it's a walk, it's a walk, not a it's not a stroll, but it's not, it's not a race. It's not about getting to the end fastest. It's about getting to the right destination at the end. What matters is crossing the finishing line, not how fast we get there. And the best way of ensuring that we get to the finishing line is one foot in front of the other, being careful to stay on track. Did you hear last year about the, um, the guy who won the Bristol Half Marathon? It made the news um, briefly, you might remember. Omar, um, what was his name? Omar Ahmed. He won it in 63 minutes, which is very good for a half marathon, isn't it? Um, he was in the, in the elite, very good time, but he was disqualified. And he wasn't disqualified because he cheated or he cut the course in some way. He genuinely ran a half marathon in 63 minutes. But he entered the 10K. He wasn't in the half marathon. He took a wrong turn. The, the two started at the same point, and he <laughs> took a wrong turn part way through the course. And, and must have thought, this is going on a bit, but he kept going, which is why he did 63 minutes, because he was going at 10k pace all the way, and thinking this is a really long 10k. <laughs> so, so he got disqualified, but to, um, to consult him, they gave him a free entry into the Manchester run, which was the week after the, uh, the half marathon there with the elite, um, to say, you did a really good job. But um, sorry, we do have to disqualify you. Some of the others complain. Um, he must have wondered when the finish was coming. So what, what matters in life is we reach the finish line and we reach the right finish line, that we don't somehow, halfway around the course, go the wrong way. Don't find we've deviated at some point and been disqualified. So one foot in front of the other, being careful to follow the signs to obey God's command. And the route is clear, it's the route of love. So that's, 
The analogy there is the obedience. He didn't obey the signs. He went the wrong way. But what does walking in love, truth, and obedience look like? This is the, uh, we've had the good. This is, now we've got the bad and the ugly of church life that John wrote this letter for. Um, John has a stark warning for this church about welcoming Christian teachers because they're, they're welcoming Christian teachers that they shouldn't. The stark warning is not every Christian teacher is genuine. Not everyone who comes and says, um, I'm credited as a lay preacher, I've preached in my church, I've got a message for you, is genuinely teaching the Christian message. Just because they say, I love God, I love Jesus, does not mean that they actually do. And we need to test and get to know people before we welcome them, and before we welcome them as brothers to teach. Many, actually, John says, he uses really strong language, doesn't he? Many are deceivers, so they're misdirecting people, they're pointing them away from the path. They're like people who put on um, yellow high-vis jackets, pretending to be stewards, and say, go that way, everyone. Um, they're also antichrist, which means opposing Christ. We're used to the antichrist in films being a hugely powerful, supernatural entity that terrifies people. John says, actually, the Antichrist is someone who deceives people into believing things that aren't true about Jesus. Far more prosaic, but, but actually far more dangerous. Far less scary, but far more dangerous than we should be far more worried about. So that's the ugly. The welcoming them is the bad. To continue the race theme, the Antichrist is much more about moving the signs, pointing people the wrong way, rather than some monster standing in the path trying to scare the runner away. What does it look like to walk in love with these people? He's saying you're walking in truth, you're walking in love, but then you've got these people who's saying you're antichrist, that's not very loving. Um, or is it? It might be an emphasis on truth. Is it an emphasis on love? Don't take them into your house or welcome them, John says. Really harsh. Judgmental, inhospitable, isn't it? Actually, the loving, it's the loving way to behave when you understand the danger they pose. Because letting them loose, John says, is a really unloving thing to do. Welcoming them gives them an endorsement that gives them a platform that means people listen. And people will then, like the guy who met John Newton, will be led away um, from the gospel. And that has eternal consequences. The church hadn't realised the danger, and they've been welcoming these travelling teachers who were actually deceivers. They might have been disagreeing with them, but they were platforming them. And that was meaning that people were at risk of listening to them, of ending up um, in eternity in hell. Which is why John says, actually, it's loving to try and take away these people's platform. Don't welcome them. Don't let them teach. Because they will lead people in the wrong path. They will end up at the wrong destination. Their work is wicked work, John says. Don't share in it. In their context, they don't acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Um, they're denying a core element of the, of the gospel there. They're saying, yes, I believe in Jesus, but when I believe in Jesus, what I mean is something different to when you say you believe in Jesus. If Jesus didn't come in the flesh, then he couldn't die as a representative man on our behalf. They're taking that core element of the gospel out. If Jesus wasn't fully human, then he couldn't have died as our representative. The man Jesus was the Christ from his birth. Christ is eternal. The man Jesus was the Christ from conception, right through his death and resurrection, and still is the Christ, reigning at God's right hand. You take any part of that away, and you are starting to gut the message. You are teaching people something that is leading them down the wrong path. You fought. Sorry. So that's, uh, that's why it was serious, and why he said, don't welcome these people. They're wrong, they're leading people on the wrong path, you will end up at the wrong destination if you follow them. So when we meet new Christians, how do we know that they aren't deceivers like this? Should we be setting a doctrine test and say, hang on, hang on before I welcome you, can you just fill in this little questionnaire here, and we'll find out what you think on um, various key doctrines. How do we avoid becoming a sect that, reflect, that just rejects every other church and says, well, they're, they're okay, but they're not quite right on this? How do we become, oh, we are the only pure church that knows the truth? Well, there's three characteristics here that are helpful in working out how to apply this in our situation, in any situation. First thing, these are teachers of false doctrine. These are people going around wanting to spread a message. They're not just believers of it. 
We all have all kinds of misunderstandings and things we get wrong, I'm sure I do. Someone only risks falling into this category if they're opposing Jesus and teaching something other than the truth as if it's the truth. If what they're wanting to do is teach something that is demonstrably wrong. Secondly, John is talking about official church hospitality here and welcome. He's writing to a church, he's not writing to an individual. When he says, if anyone comes to you, it's plural. This is where it's unhelpful to have our English sometimes. If anyone comes to you, the church as a whole, don't welcome them. He's not saying individuals can't be welcoming and hospitable, though we need to be careful. And thirdly, the deceit here is denial of the incarnation of Jesus becoming flesh. So this warning, sorry, the Christ becoming flesh. So this warning applies to core doctrines only. That is a key, core part of the gospel message. And with denial of doctrine always eventually comes denial of godly living as well. Always either into legalism or into license. That's the fruit we're warned to watch out for by Jesus. He says, you'll know them by their fruit. These deceivers will always steer those who listen them to them away from the truth, away from the path to life, away from obedience, so you'll always see fruit. So those are three hopefully helpful um, ways of applying this, ways of thinking about when we apply this. How do we apply those tests to the Lambeth Conference, which we started out with, that argument between Justin Welby and other bishops with uh, the Archbishops of Africa, who won't be coming? We've seen that truth and love need to be held together. It's false incompatibility to say you can just have love, you can just have unity without truth. It would be equally false to say you need to just have truth uh, without acceptance, without, without love, without um, treating people well. Some of the bishops who Justin Welby has used as a power of invitation to invite are undoubtedly teaching against God's truths in different ways. Particularly at the moment, the pressing issue is human sexuality and marriage, that's why they mentioned it, because the reason they mentioned it is because the Anglican Church has taught clearly for 20 odd years they've been addressing this, they have said this is the position, various churches around the communion have said, yeah we disagree, like Church in America, Church in Wales, Church in Scotland, Church in New Zealand. Just last week the Bishop of Gippsland in Australia said um, there's no obstacle to blessing the marriage of a same-sex couple. He's got an invite and that's no problem for the uh, Justin Welby. But that's just a symptom. It's a pressing issue for the Anglican Communion because they talk clearly on it and it's being ignored. But it's just a symptom. The root of that wrong teaching is wrong beliefs on authority. How do we hear God speak? On the nature of humanity, are we basically good and we just need a bit of improvement? On salvation, why did Jesus come? Why did the Christ become flesh? Do we need rescuing at all? Those are all things that Anglicans are quite disagree. The previous Bishop of Newcastle, Christian Hartman, was asked a question about conversion therapy. She retired just last year. It starts with the premise that there's something wrong which has to be changed. That presumption cannot accord with our core value of the innate rightness of people in their essential identity. That was her answer. The Apostle John said, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That doesn't sound like there's an innate rightness of people in our essential identity. More that there's an innate wrongness that needs the son as a sacrifice in God's love. So the African archbishops are right to say that truth matters, that walking in love means walking in truth. You cannot walk together with deceivers who are in practice although they wouldn't say this, Antichrist, in John's language. Some of the Lambeth Conference fall into that category. They're being invited, they're being welcomed as teachers in their role as bishops. They're being invited to meet together to teach the whole communion. They will issue calls together. So that's why they're saying we can't meet with them. We can't endorse that because you can't push under the carpet the differences that we know there are. The truth they're deceiving people over is serious and undermines the work of Jesus. There are other faithful bishops, and lots of them, who are going knowing this to argue for biblical truth, to lovingly rebuke, to call to repentance those whose life, by their lives and teaching, are denying the gospel. We should pray for both. And it's a wisdom call on, are you endorsing them by going? Because if you publicly go and issue separate statements to say, I distance myself from them, are you welcoming them? They would say no. So that you can go, you don't, you cannot go. But what you have to do is not try and pretend that it doesn't matter. 
Um, that's what John would say. If you run ahead and don't continue in the teaching of Christ, you don't have God. Eternity is at stake. And both groups of faithful bishops recognise those stakes, that the stakes are high. But that's all people over there. We're not likely to meet any of those bishops. They're not likely to come here to Hope Church on a Sunday morning. What about us? Can we welcome false teachers? It's a question that obviously demands a no, from what I've been saying. Not as Christian brothers, but what about those who believe false doctrine? They're very welcome to attend. But not to teach and preach. And how do we discern what's core, what requires this severity? It goes to the Bible. And that's why, but there's a lot of the Bible, um, so that's why we have on our website the Jerusalem Statement, the 39 Articles, the Creeds. Underlying all those summaries and statements is the authority of the Bible, their summaries of some of the areas in which there's been conflict. Can we be hospitable? Absolutely as individuals, but not as a church. And individually we need to be careful who is influencing who. So there's nothing wrong with um, inviting the JWs in if they come round, for example. But you have to be careful about who's, who's influencing who as we have, as I show hospitality to someone who is, they do deny that Jesus came in Christ, Christ came in the flesh. They're in that category. So we wouldn't have a JW preaching here, but there's nothing wrong with having them around to your house. If you've got friends who are JWs, absolutely welcome them. But who's influencing who is worth thinking about. So we should never have someone to preach unless we've got evidence of their life and doctrine. We need to know what they believe, we need to know how they live. Just because someone comes from Amy or from Nigeria, Uganda, or Rwanda, we need to check. Before Ramsey could visit us, um, he was asked to affirm the Jerusalem Statement. That's a good thing. And Ramsey we know from JPC. We know his life, we know him, known him over many years, we know his teaching. John and Ben and I are going to be working through what we see as core doctrines that anyone teaching at Hope Church must hold to and where we're comfortable to differ in our interpretation because there are things we differ on to make sure that we have the same understanding. But this isn't just a word for leaders, this is for all of us. As you're listening to teaching here, check, are we being faithful to the Bible? Am I over this? in fact? Read it through, think about it, come and question me, come and question Bang, question John. Read it for yourself. And watch our life style. See the fruit. Are we actually living it out? Uh, how is it changing us, changing our families, the way that we relate to people? Are we obeying God's command in our lives? What does our walk look like? We'd be grateful to hear those challenges. So now comes the don't run bit. Watch out, you don't lose what we've worked for, but you may be rewarded fully. So walk in love, walk in truth, walk in obedience. So anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ doesn't have God. So don't run ahead. We saw earlier walk. That's what continuing the teaching of Christ means, keeping going one foot in front of the other. In truth about Jesus, in love for Jesus and his people. If we continue on, John says, we have God. What more could we ask for? But false teaching puts that at risk. If we're tempted to wander from that path, to stop putting one foot in front of the other, in the well-trodden path of following Christ, but instead to run ahead, to forge a new path, we might lose everything. Like Omar Ackman in Bristol, we might find we've run so far ahead we've been disqualified. Jesus has given us everything we need. We have God himself. What more could there be? Both the Father and the Son. There's nothing more. But false teachers still tempt us after mirages that can only disappoint because they aren't based on the truth. So if anyone offers a shortcut to Christian living or a deeper Christian experience, if they're not teaching the Gospel John taught that we teach here, then they are based on the truth. They will only disappoint. They're not just wrong, they're dangerous. <coughs> the effect of their teaching is fatal spiritually. It encourages those who listen to it to run on ahead until they find they've left the path together. That's the warning. <coughs> and if we do so on the path, walk in the truth, walk in love, there's a great promise, there's a great reward. Um, he talks about the reward we work for. Jesus will be waiting at the end of that path, open arms, welcoming us into the eternal kingdom that is prepared for us. So watch yourselves. Don't run ahead after flashy novel teachings. But look up, look forward to the full reward that awaits you if you walk in the truth and walk in love. That was the prayer um, of John Newton's that Julie read for us earlier on. Not what I used to be, thanks to God. Um, but I'm not what I will be. So today, make me more like that, please, Jesus. One step at a time. 
Let's walk towards that destination. And then our joy will truly be complete. Because it shouldn't be a trudge. I don't want to give the impression that it's one long, dearly walk in the um, drizzle on top of Dartmoor. This, this is a, a walk with fantastic views, with lots of joy, with lots of encouragement as we walk together, as we walk with each other. We know where we're headed. We know it's fantastic at the end. We know Jesus' welcome uh, will be the ultimate joy. And we can rejoice with the others walking with us as well, as John does twice. So walk, don't run. That's the, uh, the message of 2 John. I'll pray. Lord Jesus, please help us to walk in love and walk in truth together as a church. Please protect us from the dangers of false teaching. And please keep us until we receive the reward that we've worked for. Amen. Amen. Matthew, thank you ever so much. Jesus has brought us into God's kingdom through his life of perfect truth and faultless love. And absolutely, we need to walk in this without him. So let's stand to remind ourselves and each other of this truth, of his unique gift, as we sing together in Christ alone. Please stand. confession early on, we saw that we don't show Jesus as we ought. But in him, as we've just sung, no power of hell can ever pluck us from his hand. Let's respond to that wonderful salvation. 
that we've been given through the Holy Spirit, walking in truth and love to his glory. Let's join together in the words of our closing prayer. Send us out, Lord, in the power of your Spirit. In the midst which have sung your praise, always speak the truth. In the ears which have heard your word, listen only to what is good. May the feet which have brought us together walk in those good works prepared for us. For the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You're most welcome to join us for refreshments afterwards. Thank you very much. But anyone going for refreshments, they've got to remember to walk and do a run.